Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Farrell. I'm a PharmD, a clinical pharmacist. I recently transitioned my position, uh, my clinic, to Albany Medical Center Division of Rheumatology. I'm also a professor in the Department of Pharmacy Practice at Albany College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. I've been working with a scleroderma specialist for the last 13 and a half years. So for those of you who don't know me, I've had a lot of time to learn from my scleroderma patients and be able to tailor some of the medication related issues that scleroderma patients have. Um, so today, so I know that many of you have listened to my talks before at the national conference. I've been doing you know, the medication presentation for quite a few years now, and all of those are available on the Scleroderma Foundation's YouTube channel. So I wanted to do something a little bit different and change it up a bit so that I can give you something new and um, new information and new content. It's something that I haven't really talked too much about. Some of it's going to be the same, but um, we'll add in some sprinkling and some new things. So I figured that I would go through some common questions that I get from our Scleroderma patients. Um, and some medication concerns. So we'll talk about that today. I also have a section at the end where I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about some of the drugs that we use in scleroderma ILD since that is becoming, um, since we have a, a more treatment options. So those of you who've seen my presentations, I've presented this slide multiple times. So, you know, general principles in treating scleroderma is that there really is no single drug therapy that can treat all aspects. And this is a very individualized treatment plan based on the patient's clinical presentation, based on what organ systems are affected and their individual scenario. Um, we do make sure that we follow our scleroderma patients very closely so that we're you know, treating early on to prevent organ uh, manifestations and hopefully for improved disease outcomes. I often bring up this because this is a really important point related to one frustration with medications and treating a patient with scleroderma um, is that there are often, we're often using medications off label. And what does that mean? So the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, um, will review applications from the drug companies uh, to add indications, a disease state, to the products, the medications, prescribing information. And that's often supported by large, multiple, multiple randomized clinical trials. And that's common for diseases that affect a lot of people, like high blood pressure and diabetes. Um, but it becomes much more challenging when we have diseases that are um, a smaller patient population is affected because it's hard to get a large group of those patients enrolled in a clinical trial. And then it's also hard when you have disease states like scleroderma or lupus where multiple organ systems are affected. And it's very hard to, to study that patient population because if you put 10 scleroderma patients in a room together, they might have some similarities, but they're going to have a lot of differences in their disease manifestations. So it makes it a little bit harder to control um, the clinical trial for to see that there's the outcome related to the medication. So there are a few medications that are approved in scleroderma, um, but most of the medications we're using is off-label. And that means that it generally means that it's not recognized uh, by the insurance company as a medication that can be used to treat the disease. So I've done a lot of work over the years advocating and um, getting some of the medications like mycophenolamophytol recognized in the um, national drug compendia so that they, this medication is covered for patients. All right, so let's get into some common questions um, that that I get. So what are the concerns of steroid use? So corticosteroids are something that um, a, most rheumatologists love and hate. Uh, so prednisone, methylprednisolone, these are synthetic cortisol, which is a very, very, very potent anti-inflammatory agent. So if there is lots of inflammation, these drugs work to calm that down. However, we, there's lots of limitations to using them long-term. 
So let me just, yeah. So here's a list of some of the early manifestations versus sustained manifestations. So these are some of the concerns with using prednisone or methylprednisolone for, for any length of time or at high doses. So early manifestations, uh, it's common for patients to have insomnia. So that's why it's important to take it all in the morning. Um, sometimes we'll dose it a couple times throughout the day, but generally if we're going to be on it for a period of time, we want to we want to um, take the medication in the morning. It can make uh, you feel more hungry, which leads to weight gain. It can also have effects on your blood sugar, and it can have some mental effects, so can cause mood swings. Then when we think about sustained therapy, and this is really why um, you know, all of these early manifestations, you know, we can deal with them to some degree, but the sustained manifestations are the ones that as a rheumatologist and a rheumatologist pharmacist, rheumatology pharmacist, we're really concerned it with, because if we stay on prednisone, that can increase the risk of infection, um, increase the risk for osteoporosis, so we have to screen for that. Um, and, you know, we're also worried about the stomach lining, which can be um, affected in patients with scleroderma. So while we oftentimes have to use steroids and they, we, some patients do have to stay on them for a period of time or for a long time, we always want to try to be using the smallest dose possible. So here are some ways to minimize the effects. Um, if using the lowest effective dose, and this often um, you work with your rheumatologist to find that dose. So sometimes we'll play around with using half, half doses on one day and full doses on another, um, if that works for a patient. Uh, sometimes it's using, you know, the one milligram tablets of prednisone to try to find that lowest possible dose. I'm ministering in the morning, I already mentioned that. Making sure you're getting osteoporosis screening if you have to stay on prednisone. It's really important not to stop it abruptly, especially if you've been on it for more than a, a few weeks. Um, and if you are a scleroderma patient that has the RNA polymerase 3 antibody, this is really, really important to um, avoid or not use because that can increase, there's been a correlation with increasing the risk of scleroderma renal crisis. And if you have this antibody and you are treated with steroids, so that's also very important to, to be aware of. Okay, the next question I get, and I've been getting a lot recently because my transition from private practice to a large academic medical center like Albany Med is that we are treating patients inpatient and we are seeing a lot sicker patients than I previously saw in my uh, in the private practice I was with. So um, immunoglobulin therapy is something that comes up pretty regularly in the scleroderma population too. Um, uh, it is, immunoglobulin is the replacement for people that have primary and secondary immunodeficiencies. It's part of the immune system and it's common for patients that have autoimmune disease or immunodeficiencies, we call them. And we, when we call them primary, we mean they have a primary, that's the, that's the indication they, they have a disease that um, causes a low immunoglobulin, or secondary, where it's related to the, the, the primary autoimmune disease, um, or related to a medication like rituximab. So I highlighted here scleroderma-relevant indications, which include hypogammaglobinemia, which is a side effect from sustained rituxan therapy. So rituxan can cause the immunoglobulin levels to drop, and your doctor is likely monitoring that for you. It doesn't happen fast, so it's kind of an insidious, um, a slow decrease, but it does happen, especially if patients have to stay on rituxan long-term, and, and many do. Um, also, in patients that have overlap Sjogren syndrome, um, adding immunoglobulin therapy has been shown to be beneficial in that population. Also, myositis or polymyositis or dermatomyositis, and also um, polyneuropathy. So these are some overlap conditions where you might, um, you might see immunoglobulin therapy being used. Um, the way that it works is that it's, it's made from a pool of immunoglobulins from the plasma of thousands of healthy donors. So it's, it is something that is um, you know, very highly regulated. 
And because it's coming, it, it is a uh, immune component, it's, it needs to be administered either intravenously or subcutaneously. So you hear this term of IVIG or sub-QIG. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about both of those options. So this is a little high level, but I know that um, my scleroderma patients are very health literate. So for those of you who have researched the immune system and understand it, um, you know this is a, a little bit deeper dive into understanding how um, immunoglobulin therapy is working. So in these people with a primary immunodeficiency, it's really just restoring those low levels of IG, I, IgG into a normal range and immunoglobulins are used to help us fight infections. So it's important that we restore those immunoglobulins. Um, in autoimmune thrombocytopenia, Kawasaki's disease, these are diseases with um, indications, uh, FDA approved indications, and um, where there's a little bit more data and how it works. But these conditions, the autoimmune, thrombocytopenia, Kawasaki's disease, which is a rheumatic disease that can happen in pediatric patients, and then dematter and polymyositis, th these are all very similar. Um, and there's probably some overlap in how um, immunoglobulin is helping, but it's, it's essentially working to um, decrease activation of the immune system um, through various pathways. So I mentioned it can be given as IV or intravenous or subcutaneous. And subcutaneous is something that is not, has not been uh, studied as closely or as readily uh, in scleroderma patients. I don't know if there is even a, a study with subcutaneous, um, but it's gaining, um, it's gaining interest for people that have trouble with the, with the IVIG infusion. So the infusion is very long. Um, it usually has to be given monthly, but it can take many hours for the infusion. And there are very, there are fairly high rates of infusion-related reactions, meaning patients can get headaches and maybe flushing and change in blood pressure. So this medication has to either be given in the hospital um, or the like, uh, infusion center or through home infusion where a nurse stays with you. So, you know, that's a little bit challenging when there's nursing shortages and if um, a patient has to have a really long infusion where uh, the nursing staff, staff is not able to stay with the patient that long. But um, those are some limitations that have come up for us, at least in the last couple of years. So subcutaneous is, uh, is a subcutaneous infusion, and it is administered more frequently, um, but it, the benefit is that by giving it more frequently, you're able to reach a, what we call steady state, meaning that um, you're not giving the medication, having the immunoglobulins peak, and then four weeks later, they've, kind of, they've dropped, and then you're doing the infusion again, whereas the biweekly or weekly infusions give you more of this constant exposure. And you know, the theory behind that is that it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna help the patient respond to therapy faster and also uh, have um, better, you know, better response long-term and less likely to flare. Um, the difference, there's two different types of, um, of subcutaneous infusion. There's conventional and there's facilitated. Uh, I'll go through that in a minute. And it is tolerated better from a um, infusion-related reactions perspective. So you really don't see infusion reactions. Um, you might see some localized injection site reactions. And I do have a picture to show you what that looks like. Um, and that's something that, uh, you know, it, it's tiny little needles that go into the, the, the stomach and infuse the medication. And once the patient's trained on how to do it, they can do it at home by themselves. So I'll show you, I think I have a few more things. So this is where I'm just, this is a lot of information on here, um, but I just, just to compare, you can see the IVIG every three to four weeks, which requires going into an infusion center, having a nurse come and do the infusion, much higher rate of these you know, infusion-related reactions. Um, you have to have an IV put in. Um, 
you know, those, there's more likelihood of these systemic side effects, meaning that it can affect, you know, blood pressure and headache and things like that. And then facilitated versus conventional, you know, it's just slightly different in terms of, um, you know, the individual can establish their own sub Q access once they're trained um, by their caregiver. And the conventional, which is what I've had more experience with, is that they're trained to do it and then they are able, the patient's able to do it themselves. But again, it is um, less, uh, you know, safer from a infusion related perspective. This is what it looks like. So um, the, the patient has to put these tiny, tiny little needles. So they are very small and in multiple ports, multiple spots in the sub-Q tissue, and then the infusion runs, and then they just take them out. So, um, yep, I'll, I'll uh, All right, so now we're going to talk about some questions that I get with mycophenolate, mofetil, which is either Celsept or myfortic. So this one, this medication is probably one of our finickiest. <laughs> I think that's not a very technical term, but meaning that the absorption with the Celsept specifically um, does need some specific and a specific environment in the stomach for it to be fully absorbed. So it is really important that um, we also, we need to take it multiple times a day. So usually we take it twice a day. And the goal is to get up to two or three grams um, total. And you can see here that the cell sept is, is as a 250 um, capsule and they're also tablets. So 500 milligrams. So we, we tend to use the, um, the 250 milligram dose because the, they're a little bit smaller and easier to um, easier to swallow. So for our celiac dermis patients specifically, it's also really important that we take this medication in the morning before the proton pump inhibitor. I think I have that on the next slide. Um, it needs to be taken. Oh goodness! <laughs> so proton pump inhibitor. So pro, proton pump inhibitor is a and acid, so omeprazole, prilosec, prevacid, pantoprazole. So those all medications are the ones that reduce the acid in your stomach. And it's really important that we, with mycophenolate, that we are we still have acid in the stomach to allow for proper absorption. There's been studies that look at patients that take their proton pump inhibitor and their cell sept together, or their cell sept after they take their proton pump inhibitor then the medication is not fully absorbed. So my recommendation is to, even though it says to take the PPI, the omeprazole, Prilosec, um, before, uh, you know, 30 minutes before breakfast, if that time frame is shortened, that's fine. Um, the most important thing is that we get the cell sept in 90 minutes before the proton pump inhibitor. The rate limiting step with Mycophenolate, mofetil is in cell sub, um, is that is diarrhea. So that's why we titrate the dose. So if you're started on the medication, generally you start um, at 250 milligrams once a day and then increase to two, twice a day and then subsequently add tablets over the course of a couple of weeks. There's also important for our childbearing age patients that um, they don't, they are not on therapy if they're going to conceive. And that's a whole um, another conversation in terms of patients with scleroderma who want to have, um, who, who get pregnant. It's quite a process, but um, it does require high risk um, OBs involved. Um, being consistent, I mentioned that. Um, and then uh, in serious sensitivity for the sun, sometimes I see that. Uh, but in general, my scleroderma patients aren't usually um, sunbathing. So, but just being careful and paying attention if you are um, in the sun or going to be in the sun and you recently started the medication, make sure you're wearing your sunblock. All right, moving on to some more uh, recent questions that I've received and related to COVID. We all want it to go away. It doesn't seem to be going away. 
so what can we do? We can use our you know, advances in medicine that help protect us and protect our patients that are at most risk. EvuShield is one of those options. So EvuShield is what people may refer to as monoclonal antibodies. And this is for prophylaxis, so pre-exposure prophylaxis. So this is not a treatment option. This is a pre-exposure prophylaxis, meaning that you haven't been exposed, but you want an extra la layer of protection. And we've been doing the injections for patients, um, for our patients who are on mycophenolate, who have interstitial lung disease, who are also on, on rituximab or have had treatment with cytoxin. Um, so our patients that are at really high risk and also patients that we think might have had a lower response to vaccination. So here are the indications. So if you have a patient who's moderate to severe immunocompromised that can't receive the vaccine or may have an inadequate response to the vaccine. So that's really important. And the medications that we use like mycophenolate and rituximab have been shown to significantly reduce the um, immune response. So this is a good option for those patients to just add another layer of protection. Um, you can't currently be infected with COVID-19 and you should not have had a recent exposure. So this is a list of some of the, um, you know, patients that, that are candidates. So our patients would be these active treatment with immunosuppressive or immunomodulatory medications. A lot on the slide, but um, it's given as two separate IM injections, so intramuscular, and it's given in the gluteal muscle, so the buttocks. And uh, it comes, the reason for that is because they it comes in two separate, um, the two separate monoclonal antibodies, and they are in two separate vials. So to get the combination, which has been shown to be the most effective, um, you have to do the two different vials. Um, some of this stuff isn't relevant to the patient, but uh, for those who have had the vaccine or you've gotten a booster, administer at least two weeks after vaccination. So you want to make sure that um, that you have uh, given that at least two weeks for the vaccine to, you know, so the immune system to start to mount a response to the vaccine. Um, patients don't have to wait after administration of EvuShield to receive the vaccine. So if you're ready for your booster, you know, you get your EV shield, it doesn't really matter when you get your booster. It's just the before that's the concern. Um, right now, and I don't believe that we have additional, so the drug company is looking at this, but we don't have data released, I don't think yet, related to repeat dosing. So the studies show that it lasts for about six months and um, may, vary depending on the variant of COVID-19. Um, but at this point, you know, that question is starting to come up, like, are we going to redose? Should we redose? And we don't really have guidance for that yet. The big contraindications or warnings are patients that have history of cardiovascular events. So, you know, this is a tough one because, you know, many patients do have risk for cardiovascular events, but the question is, you know, how high is that risk? And in clinical trials, so, you know, they did see some patients with some cardiovascular risks and, um, you know, quad clotting disorders. Uh, so we do, you know, need to screen those patients and have that discussion with the provider. They were really limited in the number of events that happened. So it's really hard to say if it was by chance um, or it was, you know, truly related to the medication. The American College of Rheumatology recommendations say that all um, immunocompromised patients are encouraged to be vaccinated, so we, we know that. Um, patients that are moderately to severely immunocompromised should be, are eligible for EvuShield and um, should be considered for treatment. Uh, and then allocation of resources and prior prioritizing patients that are on rituxan, mycophenolate, and high-dose steroids. So, you know, your rheumatologist is doing this, uh, you know, my rheumatologists are doing this, so the patients that are at the highest risk, um, we're you know considering them. The next question that we're going to talk about is Paxlovid. So there have been um, COVID, you know, multiple variants have been floating around very regularly, and patients may may test positive, um, and 
when that happens and develop symptoms. So when that happens, um, it's in patients that are immunocompromised, you know, we want to give them the best chance to stay out of the hospital. So Paxlovid is one option. Lopanavir is another option. I've compared them side by side here uh, so that you can kind of see some of the differences. And some things might not pertain to um, pertain to you, but the MLA means mechanism of action. So the, what's important about this this medication. So this is a novel therapy, and then rutanavir is a a very old drug that has been used in HIV treatment for a very long time. Um, it boosts. It's often used as a booster. So it it's reason for being in the medication is that it helps this medication that's targeted against the, the SARS-CoV-2 um, protease um, is stays around longer. So by giving this medication in combination with the antiviral, it's allowing um, more exposure and more chance that the um, that will inhibit the replication of the SARS-CoV-2. The problem is, is this drug ritonavir is a very, very potent, what we call CYP or CYP3A4 inhibitor, meaning that it can affect the enzymes in the liver that are highly responsible for metabolism of other drugs. So this has caused lots of um, education and lots of checking uh, drug interactions prior to dispensing in our clinic. So anytime we have a scleroderma patient who calls, they tested positive, they're developing symptoms and they've been exposed, um, we consider treatment, starting treatment. It is, there's lots of drug interactions, so that is the biggest piece that we have to worry about. Um, the, again, some of this is just comparing um, Mulpanavir, I, you know, honestly, based on the efficacy in, you know, non-immunocompromised patients, it really was limited compared to Paxlovid. So based on the efficacy, um, our preference is Paxlovid um, at this point in time, based on the current data. Uh, duration of therapy is in, is five days, um, and it needs to be started within five days of symptom onset. Um, also, let me just go back. Um, yeah, so it, it does, you do need to have a positive test. So if you have symptoms and it takes a couple of days for you to test positive, uh, that is when, you know, you do need to have a positive test. So we don't, we haven't tested, we haven't treated anyone that's not positive. Renal dosing, so if you have a kidney impairment, we do have to reduce the dose. So your rheumatologist will look at, look at that or your primary, whoever is prescribing it. Um, if patients have severe hepatic impairment, we won't, um, we need to adjust the dose. Uh, so you can see that the Paxlovid has a lot more uh, nuances about it compared to the Melanoflavir, um, but it was much more efficacious in, in clinical trials that are available. Um, in terms of tolerability, they're both tolerated pretty pretty well. So maybe some diarrhea, maybe some nausea, um, a little achiness. But again, it's hard to tell because these are used for treatment and those can be side effects of COVID. Obviously, if it's a pregnant patient, um, we have to, uh, we likely cannot use this, these medications because of limited data. Um, so we ask patients to make sure they're using uh, appropriate contraceptives. And um, there are some links here to different drug interaction. Uh, the NIH has one. If you use Google, you could do COVID-19 drug interaction checker. There's also an app, and this is if for our really health, um, our really health literate and health uh, medication information savvy patients, there is an app that you can download called Liverpool COVID-19. Um, app interaction checker and it's an excellent it's the university of liverpool has developed it and it's it's updated regularly and it's an excellent resource um, so that can also be used what are there so the next thing that we're going to talk about is newer therapies for lung disease in scleroderma patients so initial therapy for scleroderma ILD, so interstitial lung disease, includes mycophenolate mofetil, which we talked about, um, which has been shown in the SLS2 um, 
study which looked at cell, uh, cytoxin and cell sept or mycophenolate mofetil and cyclophosphamide. And um, they're really, so cyclophosphamide has been the um, standard of care for quite some time, but the SLS2 study kind of helped change that and was allowed us to use a, a better tolerated drug like Cellcept. Um, we still need to use cyclophosphamide sometimes, but it does have a lot of side effects um, and some concerns that has to be given as an IV infusion. So um, we do, it's, it, it's definitely a, a decision that your rheumatologist, a shared decision between um, the rheumatologist and the, and the patient to decide which to use. But in my practice, we see a lot, I see a lot more mycophenolate mofetil. Tocilizumab is also now approved for scleroderma ILD. So tocilizumab is brand name Actemra, which was approved, I think, in about 2009 for rheumatoid arthritis. And then last year was approved for scleroderma ILD. And this was one of the first medications to be approved for, for um, scleroderma ILD. And that's very exciting. Um, we came into some issues with access to this medication over the last, I'd say, year uh, because it was being used in severe COVID-19 infections. So there were significant shortages of this medication, which made it very challenging and, um, you know, access to the medication. Those have pretty much resolved now. Um, but again, the other issue is that it the easiest way to give it is through um, it's self-administered uh, sub subcutaneous injection. So it's like an auto injector pen. Uh, but for our patients with Medicare, it is an expensive medication. So it, it can result in a very high copay. So in some of my patients, it's pushed them into the donut hole and caused for a very high copay. Um, so if the patient doesn't have co-insurance or secondary insurance, um, it is challenging to get. The IV infusion, which is covered under medical benefits, is now of, approved to be and, and indicated in scleroderma ILD. So that's a better option for our, our scleroderma patients who are Medicare and just straight Medicare. Uh, there is Genentech, it's a Genentech drug, so they do have um, a patient support program that is available. It's a fairly lengthy process and you have to submit tax forms and things like that, but um, we have gotten free drug for a handful of patients. And then azathioprine, uh, we really don't use it much anymore. It's sort of less efficacious. Um, it'd be like a really last line option if patients had tolerability issues. And then um, if you're on this medication for another reason, TPMT is an enzyme that helps metabolize the drug. So we, gen we, we absolutely have to test for it prior to um, treating a patient with azathioprine. Rituximab. So there's lots of data emerging with rituximab, so, and specific to ILD, so that, you know, rituximab can often be used in patients with scleroderma and overlap Sjogren's, um, overlap myositis or polymyositis, dermatomyositis. So we, um, but now there's data that uh, is, is being looked at that rituxin compared to cyclophosphamide. Um, and the rituxin group did, um, did pretty good. So that FVC, which is the force vital capacity, improved in the rituxin group and slightly declined in the cyclophosphamide group. Um, I, I forgot to check on the, the, where these studies were, but there are two studies, that I'm not, and it's tough to, to know exactly what, where they are, if they're still recruiting um, or not, but there are two studies that are looking at rituxin versus cyclophosphamide and also rituxin in combination with um, mycophenolate mofetil versus mycophenolate mofetil alone. So this is a combination that we've been using. It's, you know, it's a lot of immunosuppression, but in our very sick patients, um, you know, we, we're, we're doing our best to slow the disease progression. Tocilizumab, here's some of the data with tocilizumab. So if you look at, so I, I do want to point out, I think I have it on the next slide. Um, I do want to point out that tocilizumab patient population. Um, so tocilizumab in the clinical trials, when you look at tocilizumab versus, you know, mycophenolate or versus um, placebo or versus, uh, you know, rituxin and these medications, are, when you're looking at the patient population, you you know you have to look to see 
you know, are there differences in that subset of patients? So compare, I mean, when you compare studies between um, different populations, you're extrapolating a little bit. And the patient population in the tocilizumab study, which you can see here, this is the forced vital capacity. So placebo kept declining and tocilizumab had actually kind of stabilized. Um, it got better and then stabilized. So this patient population had a, a little bit more inflammatory disease. So not all scleroderma patients have, you know, a more inflammatory disease. Um, so that's one limitation to, to this data. And I'm sure Dr. Khan has talked about it um, quite a few times. Monitoring and um, looking at like, when are you gonna use rituxan versus tocilizumab? Um, rituxan, I would say is our biggest gun immunosuppressant next to cyclophosphamide. So, you know, it does have to be given an infusion. It does cause, you know, significant immunosuppression. Um, it does need pre-medications prior to the infusion. So we have to, um, you know, give some medications to prevent that from happening. And um, there is this risk of a very, very, very rare uh, neurologic side effect called PML, progressive multifocal lupoencephalopathy, which presents with mostly neurologic um, manifestations, uh, but they can be very, hard to tease out. So um, it's something that your provider will talk to you about and watching for the signs and symptoms. And if you are being treated with rituxan for a like, period of time. Tocilizumab, again, I mentioned is a subcutaneous injection or an IV infusion. Um, a little bit more lab monitoring. Um, we watch for different anemias, which means blood, blood count decreases. And we also need to look for liver enzyme abnormalities and patients who have history of diverticulitis might be at higher risk for gastrointestinal perforation. So we have to be careful in that population. Nitatinib is our newest kid on the block, I think, um, <laughs> OFEV. So it was approved a couple of years ago. Um, we've been incorporating it into practice in collaboration with our with our um, pulmonologist. Uh, it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It is um, it is oral, so that's nice. The limitation to this medication, though, is that it um, it does cause some some diarrhea, and that seems to be the rate limiting step. Um, so the dose of 150 every 12 hours is what was studied. Uh, and showed a decline in, um, it showed a benefit in terms of decline of uh, forced vital capacity. We do need to um, keep an eye though on the GI tolerability side effects uh, and weight loss. So other things, um, checking liver function tests also uh, shouldn't be used in, in patients that are childbearing age or they need to have contraception. Um, we will monitor liver enzymes and the, also some potential drug interactions. So that needs to be checked too. So with that, I will stop and we will take questions via chat or um, live. Uh, so thanks for listening. Hey, Dr. Hey, Farrell. Dr. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. I was having some trouble coming off mute. <laughs> perfect. I was worried. I was like, oh, no, what happened to my computer? <laughs> but perfect. Oh, it worked. And I actually really liked it. This was like a lot. Like I was digesting a lot. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like way easier levels, too. Um, and it was a nice mix of kind of the, the, because I know in some of your past presentations, you've had those like deep slides with, medication and then you know what it does when no when yes um so it was cool it was a really nice balance i really enjoyed it oh good thank you yeah. <laughs> um sure. is that okay how we ended it should i re retake that um I, I don't know i said to take questions live i don't know
No, no, I think that was perfect. Um, the, yeah, the questions will be live, so you can take that. I mean, if you like, um, you could record another um, session just in case you aren't able to record live, and then I can always piece it in if if you get word. Um, okay. But I, will I be able to take questions? Like, I can answer to the chat after the session, or like on the portal. Yeah, so it'll it'll be both. Yeah, so throughout there's um there's the just the regular chat you can answer. They've got a, a Q and A box there as well that um you can kind of punch your question your answers into, and then you can also come on camera. And um, there's even another feature if, if you want to use it um where you can actually um, someone raises their hand and asks to come up on stage, you can actually click them and give them permission to come up on stage and show their camera and and all that and answer kind of the question and then they get sent back to the audience so th there's a few options but um but i think the way you ended it was fine um sorry i just need to tell my residents where i am oh yeah um, i told them but i don't know it was a lot of chaos today yeah um okay so so yeah should i just say like i'll take questions through the chat through the chat or should I do another I mean questions live I think that's that kind of implies both you know the chat and um and or um what is it uh on video there we go oh, I've lost that for a second <laughs> so I think um either one of those um works I'm sorry let's see what do I am I still sharing my screen oh what just Coming happened up on video by any chance okay yeah you are yeah. Something was up with my computer. Okay, I'm glad. Oof, I was a little worried. <laughs> I was like, is this crashing on me just very slowly? Um, okay, I had to move to the other room to like get my the internet to work a little better. Um, but no, yeah, you're coming up on camera. You're not sharing your screen anymore though. No, that came down. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, um, all right, so so we're good, right? Yeah, no, we're good. I'll, um, I'll download that video i'll post it up on the website do you want me to send you a link to it um that's okay before? all right cool and um, actually actually yes because i can use it for a training for my residents because they and my students that would actually be helpful because this is stuff that um they definitely like they're going to start and click tomorrow so perfect all right thank you yeah i'll yeah i'll send that over to you and um do you want me to send any of your other your older videos too? I mean, I've got them all. <laughs> I have the YouTube one, the ones that are already on YouTube. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, I have like a reading list for them. So it's just such a steep learning curve, and there's like it's overwhelming. So these are, I think, good for them to like start. Nice. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I'll send that over to you. I should have it ready, I'm sure, by tomorrow. Um, and if by any chance you want to jump on the um, the conference website let me know and i can jump on there with you but it, it's pretty self-explanatory i'm sure you'll it's yeah i logged in i logged in updated my profile a little bit so i can fix the description too oh fantastic perfect yeah thank you dr farrell um but no i'll um i'll take care of this editing and send you away thank you again <laughs> all right thank you bye. Bye, bye bye i don't know how to get out of here though Oh, don't worry. I'll shut it down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.